So my name is Andrea Lips. I'm an associate curator of contemporary design here at the museum, and I'm honored to moderate this discussion with Derek Lamb, who is the winner of our Fashion Design Award, and Ivan Puparev, who is the winner of our Interaction Design Award. So this is going to be fun, inspiring, and very fast. We have 20 minutes. <laughs> which will do it. I mean, my God, there's like hardly time to fit any conversation in. So we are going to get started. Um, I wanted to focus on design and the body and thinking about both of your work. And specifically starting with you, Derek, of course, your work envelops and engages the body very much. Um, so tell us more about how you consider the body in your work. Are you seeking to reshape the body through the clothes that you make, um, and how do you consider other bodily sensations, if at all, with what you do? I think my, I have a preoccupation with making sure that a woman feels in touch with her body when she's wearing my clothes. So um, does she feel relaxed? Does she, can, she, can she express her, her, herself through her body language and not be impeded by the clothing that I make? Um, so a lot of times, um, considering specific areas that I concentrate on, uh, for example, the shoulder is very important for me in terms of construction clothing so that she moves naturally. Uh, the hip area is really important to me so that she feels, again, she can express herself without speaking, so to speak, through the clothes. So, uh, hello. <laughs> That's actually really interesting, because I feel like some of that even segs, Yvonne, even into what you and I were talking about even earlier in the trustees room, because we were talking a lot about you know, just self-expression and how so often we're able to talk without even saying words, that what is it, 93% of you know, conversation, if you will, and communication is nonverbal. Right. <laughs> you know? In certain situations. Yeah, so it's interesting to even think about how just our clothing itself can really impact how the world sees us yeah. and how we're able to interact with the world. Yeah, I think especially if you're walking into a room, um, that first impact yeah. is understanding is she um, or he, both, um, able to express themselves without, like I said, without speaking. Yeah. And people identify it, mm. yeah. yeah. And to what extent are you, do you think about then the materials as well, the tactility, or sometimes even, you know, I have some pieces that like make a sound, you know, if there's <laughs> kind of like a kind of a kind of rushing or something, you know, right, do you right, ever yes. consider any of that when you're making your pieces? Absolutely. I think all senses are kind of activated when you're wearing clothing mm -hmm. and uh, I do consider it. Um, I find it really interesting when clothing makes too much sound <laughs> because it's almost <laughs> <an> imposing <laughs> onto an audience, you know, orally. <laughs> um, so I try to sometimes avoid, uh, you know, things that are too noisy. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> from all of us. Um, so Yvonne, I also wanted to talk with you a bit about bodily sensation, bodily experience, and how you leverage bodily experience to create new interfaces as well with what you do. Thank you. Um, so uh, in, in some ways, I think things we as an interaction designers and developers do is similar to what Derek is doing, is that we're trying to communicate, is, it, is this instead of communicating with the others or with, with, um, with the physical world, we're trying to build systems to allow us to communicate with virtual and abstract you know, constructs we create in digital domain, right? And I, I started thinking about this actually in the early 90s, um, when I just started working in this direction, I was in my 20s, and this idea that you know, I was inspired by all this cyber, you know, cyberpunk and all this like, you know, science fiction stuff when you go into the virtual world and everything's completely artificial. How would you interact with that? Like, how would you interact with something? And what I understand at that time is that we're already living in that world. The world of cyberpunk is here and it was here in the 90s. It's just we don't think it this way, right? Because we're using keyboards and, and mouses and we, you know, it doesn't create the experience of being there. But we're already there. We're spending more and more lives in, um, the world which we created through the computers. We are really living in virtual reality and less and less living in the physical world. So how can create interfaces which make our interaction with the virtual world more, um, more kind of 
you know, engaging and efficient, and so it feels right. So, natural. and natural, yeah, yeah, natural, because evolutionary, we're not designed to live in the world of ideas, right? We live in the physical world with, you know, trees and, and stuff and stones. Um, so how can we remap our physical body to be efficient in the physical, in, in this virtual virtual environment? That was kind of my, 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 my thoughts almost 20 years ago. So I started in virtual reality, and I quickly realized that technology is simply not there. So we can design and imagine a lot of things and come up with different ideas to create this kind of amazing interfaces, but we simply don't have technology. And then, you know, you work with artists and designers and you create installations and media, media sort of performances, but it felt always to me like one-off, so um, that's why I kind of went on and said, like, I'm gonna create those technologies myself and create those technologies which would allow me to start building these experiences. And it took almost 20 years. <laughs> it's pretty quick, though. I, mean I know, I know. It's a, it's a, depending how you... Okay. Yeah, so, how to work this but that's, I think, <laughs> that's sort of, that's, I think, uh, in a nutshell, that's maybe um, kind of my approach, is that, um, you know, as our life becoming kind of split between physical reality and the virtual reality which we're creating. And it's not questions what is good or bad. I, I, I'm not um, asking kind of moralistic questions about what was the right thing to do. It's just a fact. Yeah. So, um, and we need to adapt to that. So I'm trying to build that uh, opportunity for people to express themselves physically by being part of this um, virtual reality world. Well, and, and that's what's interesting too, is thinking about the world as an interface, you know, and the jacket you're wearing, you know, is something that you can swipe up on and control your phone and, <laughs> and there's a backpack and, you know, I mean, like, it's so interesting to me as humans, you know, that there's still, of course, is this desire for tangibility. <laughs> for the physical world. I mean, that's what we know, that's what we feel and understand. Um, but then there also is this access into another digital domain. Mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that's exactly correct. Um, you know, this, it's, it's, a, it's a tough challenge because um, you, as you completely correctly, correctly mentioned, is that we're not... <laughs> oh my God, he just did it! <laughs> Literally with his jacket! <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Sorry. That's how I do this. That's um, so funny. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Good timing. See, it works. <laughs> the DJ yeah, yeah, back there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is a uh, play the dramatic music, um, <laughs> specifically from <laughs> the. Uh, <laughs> so um, I think there's um, um, there's a question of how much we want to alter ourselves, and how much we want to create technology which allows us to map us into the virtual world, right? And um, you, know, you have people who are going so far ahead, they, they modify them surgically, modify them themselves to bend magnets to, they can feel radio waves and magnetic fields by magnets embedded into your body, or um, mostly artwork, art world doing this kind of stuff, or people who are genetically modifying themselves. Um, I was in Russia about a year ago, and this whole camp of people who was trying to kind of like genetically modify themselves, the artists, and they invited me to this camp. And I said, like, yeah, guys, later. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of busy. I'm not coming. How are they, how are they doing that? I think they, they uh, like, you know, all the cells, uh, stem cell stuff. They inject okay. the stuff in themselves. They, like, control doses of radiation, you know, in infusing mutation. Crazy stuff. Um, so the, I think you know, the only place you can do this kind of stuff like this is kind of like Russia, I think, because they just, they're crazy over there. Um, <laughs> but, the, um, but, the, the, but this is really far off, right? But it's not necessarily unimaginable, right? So at some point, our ability to communicate with the digital world will be limited mm -hmm. by what we can do. So we already have people seriously talking about brain-machine interfaces, right? That's what we do, right? We're trying to okay, well, let's capture brain waves and see what's, um, how can we map our brain waves into things happen in, in physical reality, or virtual reality. Um, we also have an opposite direction where you have a lot of things become actuated through digital world, right? So now we have self-driving cars, we just uh, talk, talk at the moment, right? So that was the, that's another big question that you were mentioning that that kind of gives you a little bit of, you know. Yeah, can I understand people's resistance to that because it is anxiety-ridden to understand, you know, how am I supposed to get around without being in control? Yeah. And I think that what you're, we're talking about is a new frontier of giving up some of our traditional control and being open to uh, 
obviously we're going to be controlled some way or another. <laughs> yeah. yeah. By, well, but, and you know, and even let me ask, and let me ask you this, Derek. You know, I mean, for all of these efforts, and you know, we really do see our lives and our world now moving into this digital domain. Then, what is the value of physical experience of tangibility? I think that tangibility is always going to be part of human nature. I think the conversation in terms of fashion right now is not so much about the touch and feel, but the ideas, whether it's um, the Me Too movement or um, just the minority uh, women's rights. So there's, those are very cerebral concepts that come through design and express through design. But I think that what's interesting is that maybe in this new world, we can let some of those kind of old world concepts that, that kind of bind us um, and find a new world, you know, that is not, um, uh, that doesn't have this kind of stain on it that we have to fight against, I think. I, that, that I think is very interesting, yeah. And we just um, we mentioned, talk about a couple, of, like, what does it mean to be human, mm -hmm. right? And now the question is, are we hu still humans, mm -hmm. right? And, and this, is, this is not so simple as it seems, because um, I was telling this story when I was working back in Disney, I was uh, working in Animal Kingdom, one of the parks, which pretty much a zoo, and then um, we were building these big interactive installations, which play this kind of like computer-generated sounds, and there was an animal right next to us in, in, in one of those um, wild animals. And we had to stop it because the handlers told us that um, it's so stressed out, it may die. Mm. So die from the sounds which is not familiar, right? So we don't die from sounds which are not familiar, right? So are, are we still human? Because, because I think the wild animals, they don't handle this really well. They don't really adaptive. They're really programmed to live a certain life and everything different create stress, which is fatal. Mm -hmm. So that's what's... Yeah, we, we die from our work. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> from our career. Exactly. You know? No sleep. No, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, slow we death. Yeah. Just, you know, this we can't is the hear very well <laughs> compared to other animals, and, but we will die from our own <laughs> journey. <laughs> exactly. but, it, but I think that all that is really interesting, and that came up we, when we were talking about this book called Are We Human by Beatrice Colomina mm -hmm. and Mark Wigley, um, which very interestingly discusses this idea about design and how we're constantly evolving as humans. We're constantly mm -hmm. designing for ourselves and for new humans. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a level of adaptability <laughs> with I, our species. Exactly. I mean, that's why we're here. That's why we're able to speak into this yeah. and talk about <laughs> ideas <laughs> Eventually. and communicate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Some of us. <laughs> Not all of us. <laughs> um, you know, and so... Stepping back a little bit, you know, and even thinking about embodied experience, you know, work that engages the body. Why, why is that valuable? Why do that? That's a good question. I'm going to pass it to you. Yeah. <laughs> you Let's start. start with Yvonne. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, there is, uh, it's a complex, like question why is probably the, com the most complex question you can ask, right? You know, because it touches on the reasons like why we're living and why we're doing stuff. Um, if you ask commercial entities, like if you're working for some big corporations, you know, the value would be like what the user experience is, how well it sells your product, does it answer some user needs. It becomes very kind of boringly, bureaucratically sort of, you know, mm -hmm. what's the KPIs, what's the sales number, how it improves the stock. So this is one why, right? So like creating something which engages people and making them happy uh, you know, they, 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 they like products, and they, they will use the products which are designed better and engage them on the physical level, uh, emotionally, uh, better than if just explain them what it does, right? So, I mean, this is this angle. I, I, don't, I, I find this is important, of course, um, and I would not argue against that, but I think it's not the only reason, I feel. I think in many reasons, it's just kind of innate nature of, of people to push ourselves Right to innovate. We we don't innovate because we have to. We innovate because it's we we want to. Right. It's like the question is like why did you um, why did you climb the mountain Everest? The first guy who was I don't know was, was it some, some some sir something Mr. in England. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he had naming. He's like why did you climb the Mount Everest? His answer was because it's there. Right. Um, 
so similarly, I think we, 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 we try to understand ourselves, like in humans being fundamentally uncomfortable with the idea of being humans, you know? And we are trying to understand ourselves, and we, we do this by changing ourselves and changing our experiences and trying to understand how these experiences, you know, evolve. And society changes over time, it's so complex. Um, so I think this is a combination of two factors, right? There's the factors of basic needs, and our needs are changing, but also the fact is that we just as a humans, it's in our nature to push us forward constantly um, as a species. I think a lot of times when we talk about ideas and we're projecting into the, we always talk about a group of people. Right now this whole obsession with millennials and then now we're talking about Generation Z and there is, a, obviously it applies um, as a collective, but why do we need something that's tangible that is more individual is because within that group, let's say a millennial, if you're a disabled millennial, so you have a different needs and different requirements when it comes to fashion or uh, transportation. So to understand that we're not just designing for a collective generation, but we're also paying attention to the individual because that's really kind of how we experience the world. We don't always, ex we have our friends, and we have our graduating class, and we have our generation, but at the end of the day, you're an individual, and you're experiencing your life through your body, mm -hmm. and your body is very different from the next person. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, and it's actually interesting, in Yvonne, your uh, object investigation, um, which was a little while ago in the trustee room, you pulled up images of the Sony Walkman, for instance, and an early Sony transistor radio from 1957, and even thinking about that idea of radios mm. and what it was. And they used to be like pieces of furniture mm -hmm. <laughs> in our homes that you would sit around with your family, and who's controlling who gets to turn that dial? It's the parents, <laughs> you know? Right. And so all of a sudden, when technology and such allows us to be more individual, mm -hmm. to make our own individual choices, I mean, there still is something which is really inherently, innately a part of us that we want to be in control and to express ourselves. Yeah. Especially now, I think, it, again, we're having this, this two conversation of a group of people. Again, I use the example of millennials because it's such a hot topic right now. And then there's the individual. Mm. And how do I stand out? So every individual has their own story and everybody has their own uh, way of engaging in the world mm -hmm. and their history. And I think that those are two kind of poles um, in just contemporary conversations. What's the group? But let's not forget the individual, you know? Yeah. We only have a couple minutes left. So I want to ask a question of each of you. So Yvonne, having now studied and practiced design for over 20 years, what has design taught you? In one answer? Um, I, 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 I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a traditional designer, right? So I I'm kind of working on the intersection of like my designs are so futuristic, futuristic I, I can't create them. Um, so I end up creating technologies to kind of create my designs. Um, design for the moment is about communication. Um, that's what design is about, and and. Uh, Everything is about telling a story. And I actually learned that mostly actually in World Disney Company uh, when I was working for Disney because there is always, what is the story? What is the story? What story are you trying to tell? It's always tasked out with a story. When they build a park, they don't bring technology people in the room. They bring writers and um, you know animators and painters, and that's how they create the first parks. So story and the communications, I think, the um, design is about communication. And we, we do this, commu we, we communicate through many, many different tools, clothing, everything else. So I communicate th create th through creating technologies for communication. Um, this is my, my main uh, observation. Derek, how about for you? I think as a designer, I come to, and, and I'm sure many people will say, I come more and more to realize that I know nothing. <laughs> um, that I have my culture, and I have my experience, and I have my um, experience as someone who works in design, but at the same time, things can disrupt the conversation um, that I never thought about. Um, 
even as something that seems so random or so different from fashion design, which is like income disparity or sustainability. And when you come across that and you realize, you know what, I never thought of that. And so what does that make me as a designer? Because I was thinking of my work from a different angle. Um, so I, 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 you know, I tell new designers or young designers, I'm like, you just have to think harder. And part of it is thinking out of the box and saying to yourself, I know nothing. I can apply my experience, but um, it needs to be relevant. I guess relevance, especially someone in my age bracket. I'm not millennial. <laughs> I'm like almost like, what is this millennial pink? <laughs> but it's humbling, right? I mean, acknowledging that I you know nothing. If you're a creative person, you have to be humble, I yeah. think, because otherwise you become calcified. Yeah, mm. yeah, I like that. So with that, yeah. So with that, thank you, Welcome. Derek, Yvonne, thank you. and thank you, everyone.